And I think that what Ben Franklin said a long time ago to Mrs. Powell, that they created a republic if we can keep it. It's a duty upon all of us to follow up with these legislators and to show them the facts and to develop a rapport with them. Meet the Pressers with Matt Mallory and Clint Mackrow. Brought to you by Public Safety and Education and the Trigger Pressers Union. And now, your hosts. Hello, you're watching Meet the Pressers with Matt Mallory. And Clint Macro. And our special guest today is a, is a friend and mentor of mine and a champion of the Second Amendment in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and across the nation, Kim Stolfer. This episode is made possible with the generous support of Shooter Technology Group, ASP, Saber Red, Lee Armory, and the SFD Responder 2.0. Thank you. Well, good morning to you both, and thank you for having me on. Um, I'm a Marine. I uh, was in Vietnam at the tail end, as my friends would say. Uh, when they left, they, we were winning. When I got there, we lost. So they kid me a great deal about that. Um, didn't care much for politicians most of my life. Um, but I ended up realizing that they control our freedoms, they control our liberties, and that the national dialogue wasn't going in a direction I felt was important. So I got more involved trying to reshape that, uh, involved with national organizations. And I realized that um, something that Tip O'Neill said a long time ago, that all politics is local, uh, really stuck with me. And there was no real impetus or uh, energy at the local level in Pennsylvania. It was all kind of like brushed aside for uh, fundraising and manipulation of gun owners, but no real solutions. Uh, legislators in the media, they have no idea about these issues. Um, and that that's determining our freedoms. So we felt that education was important and then hold them accountable to that education once they don't uh, meet, the, meet the needs of the people and our constitutional freedoms. So we formed Firearms Owners Against Crime. We, we want to really show uh, gun owners how to be involved smartly and what they need to do to be effective at doing this and not be categorized or sidelined into a tiny little uh, group that they're going to be uh, uh, derided and, and just uh, insulted through these arrogant billionaire funded monsters on the anti-gun side. Well, we all believe in education and, and FOAC, one of, as you said, one of the missions of FOAC is education. And, you know, when we teach, we all, we're all NRA instructors here and we teach the NRA classes, we talk about how accidents happen because of ignorance or carelessness. Well, when we educate those elected officials and they can no longer play that ignorance card. So if they do then move forward with legislation that restricts the rights and liberties of law-abiding citizens, it's then it, we have to assume then it's a, it's a, it's a purposeful thing to disarm the population. Or well, that's to call why we, for more gun control, right? Yes, that's why we created the website we have now, because it's unique among gun groups. We're the only group that I know of that puts the uh, the actual uh, email addresses, mm -hmm. the state email addresses, online for everybody to use. That's and awesome. we've had requests to uh, use different email addresses, which is a way of shading. Uh, the way people can contact legislators, they put it into a box and we won't be put in a box. We track every piece of legislation. We track every piece of legislation they co-sponsor and we don't hide it behind professional, if you will, uh, lobbyists. We want everybody to see it. We want the legislators to know that they are on notice, that the public has access to this information mm -hmm. and uh, as well as the votes. Every vote that they make on these issues is tracked through our website. When I first got involved in this issue, one of the things that was really difficult was you, you talk to these groups and they'd say, where's the central source of information? What's the critically important stuff? How do you argue these points? And that's the nexus. That's the missing link that we've tried to fill to energize gun owners to know that they can make a difference. You know, one of the things I do behind the scenes is I take the staff of legislators out to the ranges. I show them how the guns work. And one of the key ingredients there is they see the legislator every day. And if they know that what they're seeing in the news or seeing from other legislators is a lie, then you have a leg up in getting the, the material to the person that's going to make the public policy decision. 
think that goes exactly with what Clint's saying there. You know, you, yes. you're teaching them, and then they, you can hold them accountable. If you know, if they don't know, they can play play ignorant. Hi, this is John Green from Gun Owners Action League of Massachusetts, and you're watching Meet the Pressers with Clint Macro and Matt Mallory. Great job, guys. Meet the Pressers. I have always believed strongly that the power of the individual is the most important factor in America. Uh, that's why we're a republic. Uh, I have to tell you, I cringe when I hear the word democracy. We're not a democracy. We're a constitutional republic. We only have a pluralistic form of electing people to office, and that's a democracy. But it's a very narrow uh, focus on that. As a republic, that's the rule of law. And American citizens have a unique opportunity, Pennsylvanians especially, because that's my focus. Um, the more people that get involved, you, uh, the, the National Shooting Sports Foundation did a study a survey and they found out they estimated Pennsylvania has over 5 million gun owners, 1.17 million people with a license to carry. And it's definitely the silent majority. Mm -hmm. And you know why I think that is because they don't know how to get involved. They don't, they think that they can't comprehend these issues that they're above them. And I think it's a duty for all of us to reach out, to share our knowledge and to show them that they can get involved. You have to educate yourself. You have to have a source to get this information. You have to know how to talk about these issues. So you ally yourself with like-minded individuals, but you take a bite-sized chunk. If you believe in concealed carry, then advocate for that. Learn everything about it. Most legislators, as we talked before, Matt, you mentioned it, about how they don't know these issues. They don't. The legislators don't. So what you do is you want to go in, you want to become a resource for them. And you go in and you talk to them. Uh, based on your research of looking into this and say, not only is this the reason why we should do it, but this is why the arguments against it are wrong. Yep. And that information, we are living in an information age that is incredible. Use that smartphone in a smart fashion. <laughs> you know, don't play games on it. Get the information necessary to make the life miserable of anti-gun politicians and groups. Because the thing they hate the most is the same thing cockroaches hate shining the light of the truth on them. Well said. And anybody can do it. Yeah, well said. You send an email. If you're going to reach out to a legislator, what do you do with that email? One, you always close any contact with a legislator with this. I want your written response. Mm -hmm. You always want them to respond to you in writing. Okay. Because gun owners will many times, what will they do? They'll take and call up some office. They'll rant and rave to somebody on the phone and then they hang up and, damn, I did something good that day. But there's no way of tracking that. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do that and send an email, carbon copy your local organization. If it's in Pennsylvania, carbon copy us. We have a dossier on every legislator at the state and federal level in Pennsylvania. They have their own page. We put that information up just to make sure they can share that with everybody else. And when you carbon copy a group, say a Pennsylvania gun owner says he's going to reach out to Senator Jacob Corman. And um, he emails them, he carbon copies us. Now that Senator knows there's a connection with an organization that does endorsements. You want to, you want to force multiplier when you do that. That's why law enforcement, when they go into a, a building, they go in, not with one man, they go in with two, four, six, eight, yep. because it enables them to uh, do things safely and to be recognized. Well, same thing happens in politics. Don't just Act as a singular being. Reach out, make sure you share information, and you demand your, right, your answer in writing. And if it's not good enough, don't just yell at the computer or yell at your phone. <laughs> Call that office back up and say you want a meeting with a legislative affairs person. Go in and have a physical meeting with them. Take documents and prove it and document that. These are all ways to put pressure on. I had a state senator, when I first started doing this, reach out to another activist that I was communicating with and say, uh, to him, uh, get Stolfer off my back. <laughs> and he was told, I don't control Stolfer. And the whole point of this is I want everybody to have that reputation with a legislator. You be polite, you be respectful, but you be insistent, determined, and unwilling to accept compromise on freedom. Yeah. Actually, Clint and I were talking about that uh, a couple, I think a couple days ago, as far as the, you know, you want to be professional, 
and you want to get your point across, you can't go in there like a you know, raving crazy person screaming and yelling, pounding your fist and stuff. Cause then, especially with all the red flags, you know, red flag orders, uh, red flag laws, they, they could use that against you, especially if they think you're, you're not a uh, cool, calm and collected, if you will. Back in, uh, I guess, 1987, uh, my state legislator was Huck Gamble. He was in the 44th district. He was real close to me. He stood on his district steps and he held up an AR-15 over his head. And he says, we have to ban these. Yeah. Well, I was a lot more excitable back then than I am now. I think my blood pressure reached somewhat close to 1,000. And I said, not in my district. No, that ain't happening. So I went down. When I walked in, I looked on the wall and there was an honorable discharge from the United States Marine Corps. So I used that. I went in and I says, Huck, that was his nickname. His Ron Gamble was his full name. I says, we're going to have a talk and we're going to do it Marine to Marine. Hmm. Okay. And I did. And I explained it to him. It took me two years. But at the end of two years, that legislator said we had to ban our AR-15s, stood up on the floor. He was a Democrat and said, I have been lied to about gun control. I will never vote for it again. And I hold all of you accountable. And those were all the Democrats that were in there. I want to teach gun owners to do this, but it can't be done. How's his uh, political career today? Well, he retired and everyone that's replaced him has been pro-gun since. That's we good. made sure of it. In Second Amendment politics, you have to be able to put them in office and take them out. And I say that in a professional sense, not the way some might mistake it. Okay. Um, <laughs> you want to remove them from office politically and if they don't do the right thing and you have to have their record to do that. So um, that's why we're a political action committee with membership based and we're going to be a 501 C four shortly, but that political action committee allows us to go door to door to do uh, mail drops, to do all kinds of political activism on this, on the grassroots side that is enormously beneficial or detrimental, depending on what the record is. That's the other aspect of getting involved. You know, turn the TV off. You don't need the NFL. Go walk door to door for your mm -hmm. favorite candidate one time in the entire year. Take eight hours of your time and do something worthwhile. That's all it needs. Can you imagine five million gun owners in Pennsylvania contributing eight hours of their time? 40 million work hours? Just imagine what we could do for politics. Hello, everyone. This is Rob Beckman with Firearm Trainers Podcast and American Defense Training. And you are listening to Meet the Pressers with Matthew Mallory and Clint Macro. Meet the Pressers. In 1993, the city of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia both passed assault weapon bans. And to give you an idea of the depth of their depravity, um, the city of Pittsburgh in 1993 passed a ban that said that it was going to ban any firearm that fired all of its ammunition with a single pull of the trigger. <laughs> now, as anyone knows that's involved with firearms, that covers even single shots. Yep. So uh, between ammunition and everything, it was just a horrible, um, horrible type uh, precedent to set. It was goes against Article 1, Section 21 of the Pennsylvania Constitution, Section 25, everything. Um, and just in case no one understands that, Article 1 is Pennsylvania's Bill of Rights. And it's uh, our, Section 25 says that these rights under Article 1 shall forever be held inviolate. So I don't know what schools that some of these politicians went to, but they swore an oath just like I did in the Marine Corps. And I hold that very important. Law enforcement sw swears an oath. You know, uh, all the state legislators swear an oath. And it's not something that's just cavalier, not to me. And shouldn't be to them because they have a duty. So the uh, uh, city of Pittsburgh uh, tried to violate uh, Pennsylvania preemption law, which, by the way, calls for criminal uh, prosecution. And um, uh, so what we did when we took them to court, we beat them. We went into a consent decree arrangement, uh, which is basically a compromise where nobody was really held accountable. And uh, uh that's one of the things that I've learned in my activism over the years is the law is the law. And if it's going to apply to citizens, it's going to apply to government and that yeah. compromising with government in this fashion uh, pretty much undermines the rule of law. So then we move into the modern day and they've done the same thing. So the city of Pittsburgh has exceeded their authority Indeed. and uh, it's, it's high time that they be held accountable and hopefully 
uh, we will get some justice in the courts. Although I will say one thing, I sat in front of uh, District Attorney Zapallo. We went to lunch, and I have witnesses to this. And he basically said that uh, uh, he couldn't file the charges because he didn't feel that he could win in the court, court of common pleas criminally. And so he said that once he was passed the primary election, primary election here, we're back into politics. Yep. Uh, is that he said that uh, he would file a King's Bench warrant, which was basically jump the uh, case right over to the Supreme Court and force the Supreme Court to deal with it. Because we do have precedent, Ortiz decision and many other decisions in Pennsylvania. Uh, up to the last one prior to this was uh, FO my organization, Firearms Owners Against Crime, against Lower Marion Township, where we beat them all the way to the Supreme Court. But the district attorney dropped the ball, chose not to. And he wanted us to take and endorse him, since we're a political action committee, for his run for re-election. Now, <laughs> maybe I'm just a, you know, classical hard ass, but uh, all I can say is that uh, that's not going to happen. A person is, you know, beholden to a reputation and their conduct in office. And if they're not going to abide by the laws, I don't care if you're a district attorney. I don't care if you're Santa Claus. Fact is that you're going to uh, have to do the job and we're not going to bend our principles to meet your lower standards. If I install my septic tank incorrectly, there's consequence for that. And that's a septic tank. This is, uh, this is elected officials violating the rights and liberties of law-abiding citizens. And not only that, violating the constitutions of Pennsylvania and the U.S. There must be consequence for this. Do you agree with me when I say that this is the test case on how to defeat preemption across the country? Absolutely. You can see this from the recent Montana decision on a resolution to strengthen their preemption, how the anti-gunners are prepared to spend millions of dollars in that state and their Supreme Court just overturned their effort. So the res their uh, resolution that they're trying to pass uh, at the upcoming general election um, is going to be worded properly and not reconfigured according to their uh, wish list. But the fact is anti-gunners all across the country are doing this and are getting involved in preemption because they want to take and create a patchwork quill of laws. Mm. And um, uh, you notice in Florida, they did the same thing. Yep. Uh, that case is before the Supreme Court of Florida. So uh, it's time for everyone, every gun owner needs to realize this may not be a sexy gun ban to get involved, but if we fail in this, that it's not only going to sweep through Pennsylvania, it's going to sweep through the entire country. It's going to be used as justification. You see that a lot with people all together. They just sit on the sidelines or, you know, oh, well, how's my vote going to help? My, you know, it's just one vote. You know, we've got this electoral college thing, so my vote doesn't count. It doesn't matter. And, and I think too many people have been told that or have thought that over the years, and they do just sit on the sidelines. Or, or they just look at social media, and that's where they get their news, and they're like, well, you know, who are you voting for? Oh, I'm voting for this guy. Well, why? Because he said this on social media, or because I went to one of his speeches, and it was riveting. Well, how did he vote in the past? Look at, look at how he or she voted in the past, and probably the way they voted in the past is how they're going to vote in the future. So don't just go on what they say. Go on what they do. That's right. That's their currency, their votes. That's what keeps them in office. Um, I would add that in 1968, Pennsylvania went to a full-time legislature. And that may have been one of the worst things we've ever done because now they have to justify their, their existence, their uh, pay, if you will, their compensation. And so they, they want to just take and uh, uh, pass laws just to try and justify their existence. And I don't uh, consider that to be something worthwhile. I ask them all the time, if you want to justify your existence, why don't you do what Donald Trump is doing and start repealing laws that don't work? Yeah, that's awesome. Let's, let's face it. Gun control is government saying they don't trust the citizens to exercise their rights responsibly. And at the same time, at least in Pennsylvania, and from what I've seen, it's rampant across the country, is government is not doing their job in holding uh, criminals accountable. Plea bargaining, pre-sentence, post-trial post release. There's a whole host of things they do here in Pennsylvania that, that uh, basically obviate uh, the laws we have you now. Look what happened here in New York. The governor's new budget, he just uh, did, got rid of cash bail. Cash bail. I'm a bail enforcement agent instructor. I, was, I had a course ready with 25 people signed up. And then he uh, gets rid of cash bail so that way, unless it's a major felony, 
right? A, an egregious felony. If it's min minimal felony with no violence or any kind of misdemeanor, ROR, released in your own recognizance, here you go, go commit another crime, go see the judge. And then the judges are issuing bench warrants left and right because obviously pe people aren't coming to court. You know, sometimes I wake up and I feel like I'm in the movie, The Matrix, with the blue and a red pill. Yeah. Um, you sit and you look at the Philadelphia cop shooting that they had out there recently. Six cops. They could have been killed. Why? Because the district attorney did not use the laws we had. If you look at his records, 12 pages, and every time, virtually every time, the, the gun charges were plea bargained away. Or otherwise, they were uh, not held, con they were held not consecutively, the charges. They were concurrent. And then all of the uh, crimes uh, were set at the minimums. When I talk to legislators, one of their constant themes is we don't want to take and prosecute all these people because we don't have rooms in the jails. But they don't look into this issue because it's not that they don't have room. This, these violent criminals are a very small subset of the overall criminals. And by not holding them accountable, they're saying that 80 to 90 percent of the violent crime on the streets, which are done by this small subset of violent criminals in the revolving door justice system, are going to run rampant and they're not going to control them. And yet at the same time, out of the side of their mouth, they say to citizens, if it saves one life, we have to take away your rights. Law abiding citizens with legally owned firearms save their own lives every day in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and across the nation. Like I told you about the website being a resource, we have a tab up there where we specifically put up stories for self-defense. We have thousands of examples of it. We put up the CDC and the, the Gary Kleck studies about uh, people defending themselves with firearms. Mm -hmm. The CDC study was buried for 25 years. It just mm -hmm. came out because it verified what Gary Kleck said in 1995. And it proved that we do have millions of people to defend themselves every year. And only 1% of the cases is a gun actually discharged. Most of the time it's a presentation and the bad guy realizes he made a bad career choice. Law-abiding gun owners are not the problem. It's the criminals. And that's the thing. A lot of they, they, they can't separate the word gun from crime and from, from violence. People find a way. We had, we had uh, Grant Gallagher on here and he was talking about over in England and how there are so many like knife attacks and acid attacks and stuff. Criminals will find a way. It's not about the gun. The gun is what is righteous that helps to protect the law abiding citizen. Nobody wants to talk about that. The anti-gunners mention England as if it's some sort of utopia, at least until they debate me on TV. And I'd like to see more people use that. Say, you really want to turn America into uh, England? Well, let's look at the record because here's how they lie. If you look at prior to in the 70s, the gun crime rate in England was going down. And it was going down up until 1996 when Dunblane happened. Dunblane was a massacre, a mass murder, and school kids. And when that happened, they banned virtually every gun. But they didn't address the problem. The same thing happened in here in Pennsylvania and America is because that killer was authorized to buy the gun through the stringent procedures they had at the time by the local law enforcement and the government. So they didn't want to deal with that. Politicians don't want to accept responsibility. and They hope they can sweep it under the rug along with the bodies that were responsible for them not doing their job. So they go ahead and they ban virtually every firearm. And now the violence is up astronomically. Um, if you look at the United Nations Demographic Yearbook, England and Scotland are considered the two most violent industrialized nations on the planet. And the anti-gunners want to bring that to America. So dealing with these issues and being informed on them is really important because once you debate these clowns on TV, I say clowns intentionally because I don't respect them. They're violating the right, not only my rights, but all of our rights. And they're doing it in an underhanded way that's not truthful. So as far as I'm concerned, the Marines, the Marines always taught me to identify the enemy. And in my opinion, they are the enemy. They are the enemy of freedom. They're the enemy of our society. And they're doing this out of a greedy uh, effort to try and perpetuate themselves and to advance a cause that has no validity. It's going to get more people killed. And in my opinion, they should be held as accessories to those crimes. You had talked about they're violating your rights, they're violating my rights, but they're also violating their own rights. And, you know, those people that maybe don't prescribe to, to wanting to uh, push an agenda, they just maybe are good natured and think this is a way to fix problems. If you purposefully hurt yourself, that's a sickness. 
So if you want to violate your own rights, to me, that is an indication that there's something not right up here and you need help. Yes. Well said. I mean, yeah. If they want to do that, that's fine. You know, but don't bring it to everyone else because then you're expanding upon that problem. Well, and that goes into the whole issue of they've got armed guards, they've got secret service, they've got people protecting them. So, you know, they're, they're that being the taxpayers protected. are paying for too. Exactly. That, you know, that they're being protected. So they, you know, they, well, who needs to have a gun? Well, you do. No, I don't. Well, no, you've got armed guards. <laughs> yes, you do. Well, take a look at what uh, Bernie Sanders just did praising China for doing away with poverty. Not only did they not do away with poverty, they have a society that's becoming more and more controlled. They have very, or they have cameras everywhere. They have a social justice system where you have to take, you have a certain rating. If you do certain things, you speak out, you lower your rating. Then you can't use buses, you can't uh, eat, you can't buy food, you can't uh, fly, you can't uh, uh, get basic services. And that's what they want to bring here. Because not only is it a sickness, as Clint said, but it's also a desire to see government be this overarching, uh, provide all uh, you know, cradle to grave security for people. And it, it, it's anathema to what America stands for. Well, I'm having control like that. Now they can dictate how you want. Just like you said, that point system, you know, Oh, if you do this, I mean, it is a, a form of uh, punishment. You do something wrong and these are the consequences, but in so much so that they control everything you do that if you, they don't want you to do something or say something, then they use that, they leverage that against you. And that's not freedom. You know, so social media is doing that to us now. Very much so. You're watching Meet the Pressers with Matt Mallory and Clint Macro. Meet the Pressers. How can people reach out to you, find out more about you? I mean, it's not like they can't see it in the background there with all the web <laughs> website. <pressers. laughs> but um, any other, any other ways, Facebook, stuff like that? Uh, we have a Facebook site. All of that's accessible through our website. That's www.foac-pac.org. Twitter's just FOAC. Facebook, same thing, foacpac.org. I invite everybody to, to reach out. Use our website. Uh, use the materials up there. Those materials are available to anybody. And there, uh, many of the materials are, are valid throughout the country. So use it to uh, fight the fight. Well, I thank you again, Kim, for your for your guidance and mentorship. And I look forward to continuing to work with you here in Pennsylvania over the next couple of years. And thank, thank you for you coming too. on the show. My pleasure. It's, it's an honor. Look forward to having you on again soon. Anytime. Stay safe. We have a lot of sponsors that made this show possible. Make sure you check them out and give them your business. This episode is made possible with the generous support of Shooter Technology Group, ASP, Saber Red, Lee Armory, and the SFD Responder 2.0. Thank you. The ASP is one of our, one of our sponsors, and, and uh, I have this here safety set that has this inert, these inert canisters. I was wondering if, Matt, being that you're an instructor for ASP, if you'd like to kind of walk me through the components of this. So we've got a keychain flashlight, which I have not charged, so uh, I, I need to plug it in and charge it up. So, of course, there's a, a whistle. You know, we, yeah. a whistle's a good way to, you know, draw attention. Well, if we talk, let's talk about that too. When we talk about um, giving fair warning to somebody, so if you're blowing a whistle, that's going to alert people. It's going to get people to your to your cause, what you're blowing the whistle for, um, and then it also can oxygenate your blood and get get you kind of out of that <clears throat> out of that tunnel vision and, and get you back into the the focus of you know not being so stuck in a in a rut. It promotes up. it promotes breathing. Yeah, that's an aspect of it I hadn't considered. Yep. So also in here is this. Ohm Defender? Yep. Can you explain a little more about that? I just opened it. Is there a, a live cartridge in this? I believe there, there is. There should be a live cartridge in that. Now, now they sent some inert cartridges. Yes, and definitely suggest using the inert cartridges first. So how do I swap that out? What Do you know so, the procedure for opening this? Uh, you should just be able to twist it right open. I don't want to spray myself in the face. Yeah, well, don't push down on the actuator. So now that I put the inert in it, how do I operate this? So you put your hand over, over the top. Okay. Top well, I got to take this safety thing off button. first, right? Yep. Okay. And so then brass deactivate, button. Yep. You activate the safety, put your thumb over top of the, the brass button there and then push it and you can see it come right out. There you go. So, so you're still conducive to that fist to being able to punch if you need to, right? 
and well, it I actually kind of like stab with it, right? Exa exactly. Next thing I was going to say, yep, you've got that ability to follow up with it, another type of weapon on that. So when it comes to uh, the pepper spray, my advice is right around the eyebrows. I usually tell people from, from the top of the ears right across the eyebrows to the top of the ears is, is kind of the area you should be aiming for. Because if they have glasses on and it is an effective shot, it's in the forehead and it'll run down into their eyes and then it's going yeah. to work no matter who you spray. Well, this is a this is a decent little tool. You know, obviously, for what we do, the the firearm is the most efficient tool of self defense, uh, in in my opinion. I think you would agree with that. But having other options available to us, especially for those times when we can't carry a firearm, yep. is a good idea. Or perhaps you have a loved one or a friend that isn't comfortable carrying a firearm. Then perhaps these are other options for them. That mm -hmm. but that's better than doing nothing. Thanks for watching the show. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, and click that little bell to make sure you know when our next episode's uploaded. Until next time, adieu. Meet the Pressers.